The Global Conservation Corps presents the Rhino Man podcast. I'm John Jerko, your host and one of the directors of Rhino Man the Movie. This podcast series is a way for me to interview top conservationists on the topics of rhinos, the poaching crisis, the importance of rangers, and community engagement. All as a way to create awareness around these issues and to promote the coming release of our documentary film. In this episode, I'm talking with retired Major General Johan Eusta. General Eusta spent 35 years in the South African National Defense Force as an infantry officer, a war veteran of Southern African campaigns, and finally exiting the military as the Deputy Chief of the Army. His second career was five years as the Director of International Business Development for BAE Systems Land Systems South Africa, a South African defense company. The General's third career started in 2013 and includes the roles of Officer Commanding Special Projects at Kruger, Officer Commanding Special Projects at Sand Parks, Law Enforcement and Security Program Manager at Peace Parks Foundation, and Law Enforcement and Security Program Manager seconded to the National Department. In this conversation, we talk about General Eustace's past experience in the military and how he ended up leading the paramilitarization of the Ranger Corps at Kruger National Park. We dive into the many challenges he faced his method for securing the park from the outside in, the risks the rangers must take to protect the rhinos from poaching syndicates, and why he decided to write his new book titled Rhino War. The general wants to make it clear that all of his answers are his personal opinion and do not necessarily represent the organizations he works for. There are many great stories and lessons in this one, along with the harsh realities of the poaching crisis. So let's dive into this conversation on everything rangers, rhinos, and Kruger National Park. All right. Welcome to the show, General Yusta. Really a pleasure and honor to have you on the Rhino Man podcast. Thank you, John. Good to be here. Yeah, I feel like this is going to be a, a bit of a somber start to this episode. As you know, we lost a very good ranger, Anton Mzimba, this past week, July 26. Uh, he was murdered at his home by what we can only presume is Rhino Poaching Crime Syndicate hitmen. And it's been a very devastating loss. He was the star of our film. An amazing ranger at Timbavati Private Nature Reserve. He worked with our organization, Global Conservation Corps, very closely. And yeah, he was just a close friend as well. Kept in contact with him almost every week for the last four years and spent hours and hours with him in the bush and just an amazing human being. And maybe we could talk more about him, but, you know, I think it'd be great to start with a bit of a deeper question and ask you, you know, how do you deal with a loss like this, especially of a soldier or a ranger, you have a lot of experience leading both. Maybe personally for you, how do you deal with this type of grieving? And then what do you tell your men and women who are are working for you, be that soldiers in the past when you were in the military or rangers at, in your time with Kruger National Park? You know, what do you tell them? How to, how do you tell them how to handle this type of loss? John, yes, the military was a little bit different because that's what you sign up for. You mm. sign up to go to war knowing that you can pay the highest price. Unfortunately, that has become the reality for rangers as well. And although it is emotional, uh, I mean, you would have a hole in your soul if this is not emotional to you, even if you're not even connected to the person, the later ranger, I say, first of all, mourn. Cowboys don't cry. Us men do cry. Let's mourn. Mm. Let us make sure we give the family the best support we can. And I'm not talking only today or this week or next week or next month. I'm talking into the medium and long term. They they suffered a loss they'll never recover from. And it happened on our beat. Then thirdly, let us all be mindful that the only thing one can do is to support and help justice prevail. How empty that might sound. It cannot bring it back. But justice must be done so that those who live can see that justice is done. And then lastly, we've got to live the legacy. And that is what you tell your people. I, I don't want it to sound cavalier or or it, at all. If it is just something you emptily say, you've got to live the legacy. The green line on this continent, all over the world, but on this continent and in this country, has a track record, has been up to this, so deep for the past five to 10 years, had so many sacrifices, unfortunately probably will make. Let's make sure again that we are honorable, that we committed in our service, and that we prepare ourselves well in terms of our training and our equipment. And most of all, 
the leaders you must lead well to give your rangers the best chance possible to overcome the threat. Mm, very well put, General. And yeah, I feel like we're going to cover all of those topics that you just mentioned. And, uh, you know, for me and everyone that's been close to Anton, honoring his legacy is a, a huge, huge part of what we want to do. I mean, it was kind of something we were dedicated before all this, but it's now even more important. So whether that's through the story of Rhino Man, the film, or, you know, helping family, or just kind of continuing this fight that he was so passionate about, it's, it's a really important piece of this. Maybe we could also quickly talk about World Ranger Day. That was just yesterday as of this recording. And what's the importance of that day and just celebrating these rangers and, you know, the the things they have to deal with, the challenges and the support they need and just kind of celebrating their lives and their stories. I come from a background, 35 years of military service. In between, I spent seven years corporate, but I'm 10 years into the business of conservation and law enforcement in conservation. Uh, so Ranger Day met up with me, or I realized Ranger Day about 10 years ago. It's again up to the leaders and everybody in this sector, in this profession, in this important but important mastering to make sure that we celebrate the day. There is the stark reality of those that we lost, sadly paid the highest price, but there are those who live. And the Ranger Memorial that I was instrumental to erect at the entrance of the Kruger National Park at the Kruger Gate exactly says that you honor, you mourn, and us that are tough, that are the Green Line, that are ex-soldiers, don't like to be seen mourning, but we openly mourn. But then immediately we turn our face and we lead those that were left behind well so, so that we come out of it with honor and we don't leave anybody behind. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think, like you've said a couple of times now, it's it's very important to mourn because, you know, it's it's something deep within us that we hold, especially when it's someone very close. And I think we have to work through that so that we can better honor their legacy as well and be their completely present. So it's it's definitely an important piece of that. Could you go into maybe a little more detail? Suppose this is the you know first episode someone's listening to of this podcast. What is the importance of rangers, you know, maybe in the broader sense of conservation, maybe in the rhino poaching crisis, but what is the importance of a ranger? Rangers have, have chosen a career and are trained and prepared and led to do conservation. A part of conservation has always been law enforcement, whether it's a tourist speeding, whether it's uh, arresting an intruder. Unfortunately, that 10% has grown to these days, about 90% in some of our parks, specifically on our continent, specifically in South Africa, and then in the Kruger. Kruger, in a certain way, was and is the Ukraine of this part of the world, if you talk from a conservation viewpoint. Why did they attack the place? Because the rhinos of many years of careful breeding and biodiversity and biological management there was the cash of it. With a thousand kilometer roundabout boundary, why would one not attack that place and plunder the, the resources? In this process, one had to go to the rangers of Kruger now specifically. We need not Krugerize the discussion. And we told them, you'll go paramilitary. And please know, John, it's not military. The rangers does not operate in platoons and companies and battalions with air support and heavy weapons. It's paramilitary. We teach them military methods and techniques only to make sure that they have an advantage in terms of an armed conflict or any other conflict that they encounter, protecting the scarce resources in the iconic Kruger and then this creature of prehistoric origins. The rangers in Africa have become heroes, but it didn't come cheap. And it's up to us to honor them as heroes, but to keep our feet on the ground to make sure that we continuously train and improve. The criminals normally have the advantage as they adapt their tactics. We must keep ahead and make sure that our rangers has the best possible chance. Yeah, and maybe this is a good way to set up kind of the context for people of what the situation there is in Kruger. Perhaps briefly, you can give a little bit of a history of your military experience, and then, and then we can lead into setting up the stage for Kruger National Park, you know, you kind of said the the thousand kilometer boundary, but we can describe it a little bit more. And then what this rhino poaching 
war has been like and and your entry into it. So if you don't mind giving us a little bit of context to to your military history and then to you coming to the Kruger in the midst of this war. John, I, I spent 35 wonderful years in the army and I retired as a, as a general, a member of the army general staff. I'm a war veteran of our arguably infamous Bush war. But the last 10 years of my career, I spent in transformation, restructuring, rebuilding, reimagining an army that would suit the purpose in our, in our new democracy and in our country in transformation. So on the one hand, one has the dust on the boots. One has really been there. One has led in combat. One has run the risks. One has had disappointments. Stakes was made and one could be victorious. On the other hand, those then who say, and I'm not being now presupposing that says the old general only came here to make war, us that has been to war know our futile worries. And that was my mindset going to Kruger. I was fully aware that the conflict and the law enforcement and that, that is not the solution. You've got to do it. There is, there is no way out of it. And you cannot enforce the law half-heartedly or apologetically. So the, the last 10 years of my career prepared me well for the diversity and complexity of the situation where we are only custodians of nature and parks. That's all we're here for. But now you sit in a park, an iconic park, you have the specific threat, it's embarrassing. You face your political leadership, your line leadership, the media, the international media, almost the whole world, and then specifically the world of South Africa, the, where we so dearly love our nature, with the expectation that the general will sort this out. How can he not? Be, it was big acclamation when I was appointed right or wrong. <laughs> Coming from that background, through transformation into Kruger, I'm honest to say that I was not really prepared for what I felt. I had no illusion. When I was appointed in December 2012, flown in there on the 12th of the 12th month, 2012, I realized this would not be the proverbial walk in the park. But I was not prepared for what I found, the losing three rhino a day. It, it, it gives new meaning to 24-7. And day after day, you've got to make plans, you've got to move on, and you've got to do what is necessary right there. They say, a wiser man than I said centuries ago, what is a good general? Is he a tactician or a strategist? They say, no, those who win. And there I was sitting, everybody looked over my shoulder and I realized this cannot be done in months. And th that was emotionally very hard on me. Am I, am I losing it? Am I not living up to expectations? Am, am I not able to lead? this people and transform them into an anti-poaching unit. So I wanted to live through that on top of it all and communicate up the line to your board, to everybody, and most of all, to the public of South Africa. And for that, we use the media generously and almost liberally. And they criticized, but the media covered well. I, I had to sort of buy time for the Rangers. Don't expect mm -hmm. them to do it tomorrow. We will do it. Yeah, can I interrupt you quickly? So you've written a book recently, just came out, I believe, in June, this a month, about a month ago. And you mentioned in there, you know, I think part of you taking this job, you realized they were serious because they were giving you, was it a five-year contract? Because I, maybe people from the outside don't realize that there's a lot of politics involved in these types of things. And, and sometimes people get hired, they get, you know, maybe two or three months and then they're criticized and then they're ousted. And I think it seemed like you realized that this was going to be a challenge that wasn't going to be solved in a year and you needed that time. So maybe talk a little bit of that about that. John, yes, uh, it is a known fact that I was mature when I took the job of Chief Ranger. I, I took it uh, after my second career when I was 60. First of all, you made the point of a country in transformation, political factors that plays a role. It was very bold of the management of Kruger at the time to appoint me in this post. And then on top of it all, to give me a five-year contract, I would not have settled for less than three years. I have the theory, what you cannot touch the first hundred days, you will not touch. And what you cannot achieve in the first thousand days, you will probably also not achieve. So I would have taken it for three years, not, not shorter. But apart from this bold step to appoint an ex apartheid era general, there was a consistency of support from the minister at the time 
from the chairman of the board, from the CEO, specifically when it took us two, three years to stabilize the situation, my contract was a two-way one, one month's notice. So there's something in there for which one is grateful, one was allowed to to formulate strategy, but also to execute it. And although there were many obstacles, as I explained in the book, there was great support for a great cause. Mm. Yeah, so maybe let's let's kind of get back to the setup. You know, you were brought in, and what was the situation like when you were there? I guess, again, for context, for people that don't really know much about the area from outside of the country, set up Kruger National Park. How big is the park? Maybe a little bit of the landscape. Just kind of paint a word picture. And what was the rhino poaching situation like? You step into this park, it's 2 million hectares, it's 350 kilometers north to south, just under 100 east to west. If it has a 1,000 kilometer roundabout boundary, if, if, if you travel from London across the channel, the other side, you've got to do that a number of times to make up that distance. It's the African bush. It has a it has a fence. No fence in this world can really stop people, not criminals and not destitute, hungry people. It was the onslaught was severe. We would have eight incursions a day. We would only count an incursion if we we saw the poachers. There was an exchange of fire. We saw a fresh camp or fresh tracks, spoor, as as we talk. It. And at any one time there could be a dozen groups of poachers inside the park. How do you get to them? Which of the thousand kilometer part do you now guard and, and which not? And how do you al- allow your ground intelligence to inform your decision making and later on a bit more technology to make sure that you deploy intelligently? To fly in with a helicopter and see three rhinos just lying on, a, on an area the size of a football field had happened often that time and often in the barbarity which we t- t- took place and the, the cows killed, and the calves running around squealing. And I saw many of it, but I remember the rangers saw it daily. And what it did to their psyche in this sort of never-ending scenario was very hard on them and their families. Mm, yeah, and how many rangers were covering that amount of land? Because I think that's another thing that people don't realize. Yes, we, we after some additional recruiting at 400 rangers, now, you, you can make the calculation, what does that give you, how many square kilometers per range? And not that that will be an exact calculation, but that's an indication. When I took over, I, I indicated that uh, we needed two light battalions, a thousand people at least. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, that was not doable. You'll change the whole park. You'll have more aerials and guns and land rovers than what you have tourists, and it would also not be affordable. And that is why, John, Apart from focusing immediately on ranger mission readiness and ranger wellness, we also went into close alliances with all our neighbors inside Mozambique in South Africa, and we explored technology. Just to give us better situational awareness, better technology intelligence, combined with the human intelligence, and help you to get a bit more proactive and send the rangers that you have to the right place, deploy intelligently. Yeah, I think you cover that well in the book. Can you talk about maybe for a more of a, a logistics and leadership and organizational standpoint, what was the situation like when you arrived and how did you start to develop a plan to, to bring people together to improve communications, things like that? Because it seemed like that was a big, big part of the challenge there. Yes, indeed, John. And one is on thin ice. You will see that wherever I criticize in the book, I will not mention a name. It was not as if people were bad or didn't do their work. It was just that the system was not up to it. Here you have a park. A park breathes and it has a rhythm of seasons, of day and night, of rain, of wind, and also of tourists hanging around. Here you come with an urgency that is unbeknown to any park. And every day you go upstream because mostly it's urgent and often it's bad news. So whether you want budget, whether you want support, whether you want to appoint somebody, you were always sort of against the grain. The park was not geared for this. A, a good work was done before I came already. People incrementally started doing things. The park was not geared. The logistics was sadly lacking, apart from the fact that it was not geared. And then the whole management structure, because it was not a command and control structure, I changed it into command and control. The management structure was almost on a matrix base. 
reporting to tourism and reporting to conservation. So at, you found a, a range of core facing these challenges, not well supported at all. And can go into too much detail on it and not structured to function as a unit, to function collectively later on with the additions and the force multipliers that we deployed. Yeah, and I think, I guess that makes sense. You know, the park wasn't really set up to be defending from this type of threat originally. So I guess back to some context for people that don't know, where was this poaching coming from? Where were the people coming from? What was kind of driving it? Maybe give a little context of why the horn was so coveted and, you know, just kind of thinking for someone that doesn't understand the situation. At the time, about 2013, 75 to 80% of incursions came from Mozambique. And by end of 2013, we had it down to over 30. But then they came from the South African side. Other nationalities also coming from the South African side. What we proved in Mozambique is that it can be done. You can involve, there were seven different parties that we involved. And slowly but surely, we rolled it back. Slowly but surely, the neighbors on that side cooperated. There was an investment in the security agencies from the private sector. Also, the threat, the demand for rhino on just made it low risk and high return, the crime. So they would do it over and over again. West of Kruger, the situation was almost 2 million people destitute. Not 30% of them are employed, I'm, I'm quite sure. So you had poverty and no other choices, no options. So they were recruited into poaching. And unfortunately, with time, you had a toxic mix of poverty and greed. Every time you do it, you come back successfully, or which the chances were good. You get a convenience store plastic bag with 100,000 or 200,000 rand in it, and it changes your life. And that spawned it. Not that they there got the real money. The money uh, comes to the, the networks that are in the Gauteng province mostly of our country. Mm-hmm. This demand, who could have foreseen it? Because if we started this earlier, hindsight, it's, we could have contained it earlier. The growing economies, the flourishing economies in Southeast Asia as the consumer countries, the demand for rhino correlates with that. And you have many destitute, hungry, desperate people around this paradise and they come poach and they deliver and the poacher bosses get the big benefit. Yeah, yeah. these syndicates, they can prey on these people that are in a desperate situation and convince them to do some pretty terrible things. Maybe you could give us a picture of what are these poaching units like? I know they probably have evolved over time, but can you kind of give us almost a story of what it's like for them to come into the park and then what the rangers are trying to do on the other side to stop them? First of all, uh, you would, like I said, it gave new meaning to 24-7. You would, originally they would peak at full moon, but then they realized we, we ramp up towards full moon, then maybe weekends, then maybe payday, then maybe a year in dollar days. Uh, the fact is that they they kept coming. They, the typical poacher group, three males, typically between 18 and 40 uh, on average. They are in tatters. They have a second hand pair of North Star tackies and tattered clothes. They might have a rucksack, in the rucksack, some buns or a tin food, sometimes some drugs and sometimes soft alcohol. And then of course, number two carries this rucksack, number one carries the rifle, and the other one carries the axe or the knife to execute this crime. They would walk into the park by last light, cover 25 kilometers easily, lie up and observe the rangers and the rhino. In the dry season, it's easier because they know the rhino will come to the water. Normally, late that day, they would kill, take the horn and run. And in, at that time, on the Mozambique side, they will be picked up by poacher bosses on the boundary there before we had our private reserves and concessions supporting us from that side. They will all would have gone through the Sangoma, the traditional healer, and they would carry the evidence on them, believing that they are invisible in their tradition and, and belief system. Mm, yeah, Muti, they call it, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and so the rangers, you know, how how are they trying to counter this and how has that kind of developed over time? I think we'll, we'll talk even more about the Rangers, but just in this kind of particular situation, painting that picture. 
before I talk the tactics, John, that you, you're asking me about what was our tactics. First of all, my, my, forgive the, uh, my message, I message, grand strategy was to clear this park from the outside. That was very easy to determine. That didn't take military expertise or a SWAT analysis or a consultant. Clear the park from the outside. It's like the peels of an onion. You start in the consumer countries, work your international networks together with Interpol and other agencies, come onto the continent within the Sadiq region, within the structures that are there, and then onto your neighbors. And that is why you, you, you needed intelligence. Mm. And in our instance, information, and you need law enforcement agencies to cover that part. Inside the park, tactically, and I don't want to sound too military, the challenge was to be persistent and unpredictable. Persistent. You cannot skip an hour or a day or anything. And unpredictable. Don't fall into a routine. The, the poachers, the criminals love routine. That is their information that puts them at the advantage. Now, to achieve that, there were three parts of, of the tactics. And let me remind you, sometimes in life, tactics are more important than strategy. I learned that again at a mature age. Your first part is you do protection. Make sure that you have layers of protection. You start outward as far as possible. You, you work it up to your perimeter. And we don't say boundary or fence. A perimeter is a multi-layered concept. Where you start outside the park and you work right inside your park where protection is done through area dominance. And later on, we started using technology with great effect with this to get early warning and to get better intelligence of where to expect incursions. The second part is to react. And this is where mobility and specifically air mobility comes in. There's nothing as bad as knowing or getting early warning and not being able to react. And the four helicopters that we ended up sounded very, very luxurious. I can assure you, try and protect a country the size of Israel or Wales with four helicopters. So you've, you, you had to react. Whether prepositioned assets by foot, bicycle, off-road vehicles, vehicles, air. And lastly, the concept was to be more proactive. Always, always work towards being more proactive, having better intelligence so that you preposition better, you predict better, you deploy your resources, and you try and stop the crime, even outside the park. Mm. Th that, is, that is what we matched our training to. If I look at these facets, you had to train for this and teach the rangers the techniques that comes with it. Yeah, and I, I think I kind of want to go into the Rangers more now, but you did bring up some points where I, I think you did a good job in the book of going through these, and I'm sure you faced a lot of criticism, especially eventually want to dive into a little bit of the green military militarism and, and that side of it. But I think this bigger strategy, most many people may not think, <laughs> you know, from the outside that that's a part of it, clearing from the outside first, you know, things that we'll go into more, working with communities and other organizations and you spend a lot of time collaborating and connecting with people and raising funds and, and so much more than just, uh, you know, military operations standpoint, which maybe a lot of people think that's, you know, being a ex-retired general, that's kind of what they probably imagined. But before we get into that, because I feel like that's a big topic itself, focusing more on the, the Rangers themselves, what was their situation when you came in, uh, maybe in terms of equipment, training, you know, like we were saying earlier, before this poaching crisis really took off, rangers were were much more of a conservation focused in terms of, you know, maybe they were doing research or fixing fences or uh, keeping up with the wildlife and things like that. And then all of a sudden, this paramilitary side became increasingly important with the pressure from the poaching. So I think, at least from what I gather in the book, when you got there, they were still kind of struggling through this transition and, you know, adding rangers, but maybe the equipment wasn't really all there. I don't know if you could go into some of the details of what, what's it, what kind of um, situation they were in when you arrived and what you did to help improve that, whether that's training equipment, just kind of working with them in a much more human way. John, I, I always jokingly say you get hardware and software. That's fine. You get helicopters, you get vehicles, you get computer programs on the software, but then you get wetware. Technology makes things possible, only people make it happen. Wet where I refer to as homo sapiens, is a ranger. <laughs> there was never any doubt. With time, people overemphasized the green militarization and thought that I'm after technology. 
I wanted the Rangers mission ready. Trained up to standard, equipped up to standard, and led well. And under led well was discipline. From the very first day, and there were risks involved in it, uh, you can overcook the pot with a grey-headed guy coming in from somewhere and insisting on absolute discipline. Mm. But I also knew that you can only breed pride from discipline. So part of the whole approach was discipline and training. Let me hasten to add, from the very beginning, Ranger Wellness was top of the list. We took great efforts towards Ranger Wellness, physical. How, how do they live? What is what the state of their equipment? Social, how can we support the families? Psychological, we are a part-time psychologist. Giving the assurance of legal support, we had a part-time advocate in the park. A and even spiritual, we had to look after the rangers. And it was not as if we did them a favor. They deserved that. And they, I always said, people won't care to listen until you show them you care. And despite the, uh, the hard times, despite the demanding circumstances and training, apart from mission readiness, they could be spiritually prepared and psychologically prepared for the task, which I knew would be a long run ahead of us. We had to prepare for that specifically. The wellness part came to a head when end of 2013, Arena and myself visited all 22 ranger stations. It takes three days. And coming back home, she said to me, a ranger post need not be a pit. And she launched project Relax. That meant that you go into that base you get the honorary rangers, the volunteers to adopt a base. You put a jungle jungle for the children. You put up a booster so that people can phone home. Here and there you can put up satellite TV when they are there. The cooking facilities. That added up. We started vegetable gardens. We started a mini soccer league, even though many was in the field and couldn't always participate. We looked at the spiritual support and Project Relax became one of our backbones to show care and to make sure that people realize every day of the week and month that they're cared for because they feel it, they experience it. It's not a general landing with a helicopter and ask, how's the food or how are you guys? We prove to them that we care. What kind of effect did that have? I mean, was there, was there a tension when you first arrived between you and the Rangers that were there or some of the other leadership? And how did that change over time? Yes, there, there, there was tension. My appointment came rather abruptly or occurred rather abruptly. I don't think there was time necessarily for consultation with the army, the police, and within the park. It was a decision that was made, a very sober one. And in hindsight, maybe ma change management could have been a little bit better. But then on that specific day with due intent, I was flown into Kruger with half an aircraft full of media people and the other, the top structure of Kruger, and appointed, and one could sense uneasiness. It was the odd individual whose eyes I met and met my eyes. And there was one of the senior rangers who said to me, we will support you. The rest were very tentative. The leader group, partly because why this man, why am I not promoted? The junior guys just wondering now, what can and will this man do to improve our lot? The army immediately said, I was then seven years out of the army, and now here I'm back. The army said, oh, yes, a general should lead this, but we can second a serving general. Free. <laughs> the police said, yes, it's right, a general, but it should be a police general. So it wasn't exactly a big welcoming party. And the, the main reason I could live through it was setting the example, John. There is nothing. You get orders, standing orders, routine orders, patrol orders, but the general order is example. And one could, with time, pick that up. And at Ranger Day that first year, 31 July, when we gave a display, we had the top structure there. It was a festive day. They were well-dressed. They were well-disciplined. I realized that day that we're on our way towards establishing the best anti-poaching unit on the continent. Mm, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about leading by example? Because I think you've you've learned so many leadership and great skills over the years, just kind of going into that from like a, your own experience. A leader and a general place themselves from where they can have the best influence. It's not always the front line. 
There are times when you've got to be in the front line. But don't try and lead. You've had your time. Now that you're a general, you want the dagger between your teeth and you want to do fire and movement. That That's very unintelligent. But you've got to be seen front line. You've got to be seen at the range of post. You walk the range of post at least one quarter. I engaged with the unions at the time, who was quite hostile, three, three different units competing with each other. In terms of a physical example, your punctuality, your general appearance, jokingly people will tell you about the shining boots. I cannot get you up in the morning and get you shaven, your boots polished, your clothes ironed. <laughs> what are the chances that you will pay attention to other detail and important things? Your boots are not clean, what are the chances your rifle will be clean? If you're not punctual, how do I know you'll be punctual on patrol and bring in the helicopter or uh, uh, communicate per radio so that I can understand you? Yeah, I think that's so important. I kind of believe firmly as well that the way you do the small things in life are the way you do the big things. So all your habits kind of equal the person you become, which it sounds like that's something you believe in as well. My philosophy, John, and I reaffirmed it that three years in Kruger before I moved to air office. Think big, start small, act now. Think big, there's always a bigger picture. Don't forget the bigger picture. Don't think too small or unambitious. Start small, don't do analysis paralysis. If I think and work, you engage and you do it without being silly. And then act now. You have to be bold, there are things to be done. In this instance, there was a war to be fought. And I know the war terminology is also a bit controversial. That's not the point I'm making. You've got to be bold. You've got to do the th right things right. You will not always know what the right things are. No law, no legislation, no rules, no regulations will always tell you exactly. Then you do what you believe is right. And the more you do that, the more you build character that allows you to discern and brings that wisdom that will make sure that you act when you're required to act upon and not hesitate and lose opportunities and neglect your duty to lead well and set the example. Let's talk about the training a bit because, you know, I, I think it's probably, it seems like the Rangers were kind of in varying levels of training when you got there. What type of training did you put the Rangers through? What type of training do Rangers go through? I know you guys worked with the Southern African Wildlife College quite a bit, which I'm close to as well. So maybe talk a little bit about the training side of it, why SAWC was an important partner in that and what you guys were trying to achieve. I could almost not understand at the time that I started there that we don't have a, or didn't have a formal agreement with the Wildlife College. They're our academy, they're a center of excellence. So I set in motion the whole process to get that approved, which is not easy in, in this year's sand parks or in the civil service in our country. There were some training programs that we consolidated, and most importantly, what we would call almost militarily is immediate action drills. What do you do when you face fire? You, you have to prove afterwards that it was self-defense. It happens at night. All you see is the reflection on the rifle barrel in the moonlight, literally. And you've got to decide because you've got to stick to the rules of engagement. So part of this immediate action trailing was first aid, because you had to be prepared for that, rules of engagement, crime scene management. You're the first responder. You arrive at the scene of the crime. How do you make sure that you don't break the chain of evidence right there? Then the normal things of discipline and drill and rifle drill. And funny enough, probably the most important thing we did was tracker training. Yes, rangers can track. Not all human beings can become master trackers. You get A, B, and C class. We made a huge investment in that. If you cannot track in the African bush, you're almost illiterate. That was probably, mm -hmm. in my book, the most important skill that we, we taught and, and affected to where we could, according to the capability of each individual. Did you have many, I don't know if you'd call them natural trackers, but just people that were so close to the bush growing up that they were amazing trackers? Yes, there were just many of them, yet again, tracking, man tracking is totally different from, from animal tracking. And, and the understanding of the poacher tactics, which will intuitively lead you and add up to what you physically see. 
that is what we have to train and that is why to, we have to exercise and repeat so that it becomes second nature. Mm. You're speaking of, you know, what do they call it, anti-tracking or hiding their tracks and things like that to try and confuse rangers. You had to learn how to, to read those signs as well. Absolutely. You had to understand poacher tactics. Know that they will mislead you. Know that they'll try and mislead the canines, the dogs also. And active counter-tracking. You would find sometimes in their rucksacks only socks. So they walk on socks. They walk backward. They jump from stone to stone. Now, to track then, you cannot say, I'm sorry, I cannot track you now because it's, it's a rocky area. You've got to then anticipate, look at rocks or stones that has been displaced, for instance. Look at grass, look at leaves. Uh, listen well when you go down. Because the more pressure you put on the poacher, the more mistakes they make. And when they make mistakes, that is when you normally get the better of them. Mm. Can you talk a little more about rules of engagement? Because uh, I think a lot of people might not understand how they're allowed to engage as rangers. South Africa is not a shoot-to-kill country. And I think, you know, rightly so. I feel like a country with good morals and ethics wants to you know, give people the benefit of the doubt, especially if you're at night and, you know, who knows, anyone could be out there and to, to engage with them and just shoot without any kind of warning could end up in a bad situation. But it's also, you know, these people, the poachers do have weapons and they're willing to shoot back. So it's, it's a tough balance, but maybe you can go into a little more depth on the rules of engagement and how a ranger properly meets that challenge. Rules of engagement, extremely important. First of all, we're a civilized country. We're a civilized people. And then as rangers, as an anti-poaching unit, we're professional. One would be taught and repeatedly taught on a quarterly basis in your language exactly under which conditions you may defend yourself. And like you rightly say, at sometimes a second, it's a split second in which you have to make the decision. But you had to ensure that as far as humanly possible, you did not transgress. You know, it was sad when people speculated that we have a shoot-to-kill policy while the opposite was true. When I took this post, the nation said, now we have a general. He will win the war and he'll do hot pursuit and he'll build a Berlin Wall. And I did the opposite, as I explained mm-hmm. earlier, because those are not the, the solutions. I put it in simple terms to the rangers. I said, bring me a full house. A full house meant I want all three poachers alive, uninjured. Now that is a challenge. Now that's neat. Then you become very professional. One must remember that when there was an exchange of fire and when there was fatalities, it immediately became a crime scene. On minute, immediately you tape this off, you bring in the police, and it becomes a crime scene and a murder docket is open. And why I mention that, now that ranger, it's traumatic enough to have to kill or to wound somebody, must now live with this until the Attorney General has decided not, decided not to prosecute. Of all the stress factors, that was the most severe. Police coming in, taking your rifle, taking your A1 statement, murder docket opened, and that is how you and your family live till weeks or months later, you notified that you will not be prosecuted. Rules of engagement it's not so unique to rangers throughout the world now when you have military deployments in operations other than war. It's part of the life of disciplined law enforcers. Yeah, and I, maybe you can talk a little bit about the detail of the situation with the courts and the crime scenes and why it became really important for rangers to understand how to collect evidence and, and do things in a regimented manner. Because like you said, these murder cases would be opened and then the rangers could, they could go to prison, the poachers could get away and a lot of bad can come from it. So maybe talk about how that's developed and what you did to help make that a a more streamlined process on kind of both sides, the ranger side and then the court side as well. Absolutely. I always say to the rangers, there must be a chain of evidence. Only you can ensure that we even have a chain. If the first link of the chain is not there, if you haven't kept your cool, make sure that you don't contaminate the area. If the other responders come late, that you bag and tag, that's how we say, you make sure every little bit goes into a plastic bag and it's tagged, make sure that we have a chain. And that also requires discipline. And while you do that, it's an African bush. It starts raining and you've got to act then. Make sure that you collect the evidence. 
and make sure that when the police arrive, you can give proper account of yourself exactly what happened and make sure that you have leader group on the ground to guide that. There were many such scenes at one stage, hundreds, which actually was the police's work to do the crime scene, but uh, we had to combine forces to keep up to date with it. The court cases, there were such brave people, there were such brave prosecutors, all of them incidentally ladies, that did stacks and stacks of dockets, tediously working through every case, going to court, the ranger outside court would face intimidation, would face scorn inside, the, the prosecutors would face the same. Then, over a period of two, three years, we convinced the system to open the court in Skakusa. No more traveling to court, no more unnecessary intimidation, shorter turnaround time, and more consistent convictions and punishment thereafter. The story of the prosecutions, the story of what it takes, the emotional energy that it takes, volume of it, is also sort of an untold story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a quick process. And for some more context, Kakuza, which is in Kruger National Park, the courts there made it a lot easier, like you said, for the, the rangers to be able to not have to travel so far because even if there's a court that's on the border of Kruger National Park, depending on where you're stationed, that could be quite the journey to get there. And that's just a lot of hours of back and forth for who knows how many hearings and with all that added pressure that you just mentioned, that's it's a lot to deal with. Yeah, a very practical problem. And the time ultimately that your rangers spend in court testifying also, it takes 10 or more percent away from your manpower every day. Mm. Can we talk about the pressure that these rangers face on multiple levels? I think maybe starting with, as you're engaging with a poacher, there's that moment where they might be shooting back at you. You have to shoot at them. Maybe you injure or kill someone, and then you have to go up to them. And then all of a sudden, you play a completely different role where you might be giving medical assistance, collecting evidence, you know, helping someone that you were just trying to kill essentially, or at least, you know, capture um, or defend yourself from. And it just seems like a, a really tough emotional shift to have. And, and, you know, at the same time, you're seeing rhinos day by day carcasses, which, you know, it's a, I've, I've been up to a couple poached rhino carcasses and it's a, it's a tough experience, not only visually, but just the smell is so intense. And you're having these experiences day in and day out. What is that like? for a ranger. I mean, I'm sure you've personally been to a lot of these scenes as well. So what's that experience and how do people manage that? You're right, John. It's it's hard to explain. I mean, you get dead animals. One has seen scenes in one's life, but this repeatedly and that smell, nothing is pungent and is repulsive in the world. Now, the rangers used to face that almost on a daily basis. And you're quite right. One was proud with the discipline, the humanity, the civilization. Yes, that is first aid. Yes, if it was urgent, we even flew in the doctor. The Skakusa doctor flew to many scenes, as is explained in the first chapter of the book also. The rangers in that process faced five dangers that I normally group. To die or to get injured, severely injured. To be convicted, if ultimately charged to become deranged simply through psychological pressure, to become alienated in your own community. You're the hero there in a the park. When you go to Mkuflu on a Saturday morning to the spa with your family, you might find you not the hero. And then in latter years, as the poachers and the crime syndicates change their tactics, the risk of being alienated and then ultimately betrayed. When your own betray you with corruption and helping and supporting the poachers. Severe pressure on them and the families, and I mentioned Project Relax earlier, this later developed into Project Embrace, where the honorary rangers would bring in mostly retired volunteer psychologists and social workers to help some building of resilience, understanding stress, teaching skills, how to relax, how to manage the household situation under the severe pressure. Mm. Have you had any personal conversations with the Rangers after having this type of maybe an emotional response to seeing a lot of this tragedy and being a part of it? 
what have you had to say to Rangers personally? I mean, I know you've got the supports from these amazing psychologists and doctors that that helped, but I'm sure you've had some emotional conversations yourself. Yes, one had, and I I would really care to to go into detail. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you cannot do this without emotion, but one had to distance from that. It was mostly being there, looking them in the eyes and put a hand on the shoulder. There is not a lot you can say at that moment, uh, but you've, you've got to be there as often as you can. And where I couldn't go nearly to as many incidents I wanted to, get on the ground and listen to what they are saying and do everything possible to ensure their wellness. And in this instance, psychological wellness, guilt feelings, and severe stress. Let's talk about corruption. I know that's a big topic, especially with this rhino poaching crisis. And I guess we kind of talk about it from a couple of different angles. You know, what is the corruption like? How much is there? But then uh, this is just, you know, like, as you mentioned, another pressure that these rangers have to face, that there is the potential for corruption either within the ranger corps, which is probably honestly the, the less likely place, although it does happen. But, you know, corruption within, it could be other people within the park or just in their communities or other people that give them up. Maybe talk about this corruption and, and how it's kind of pervaded. Just to be got more effective, the tactics of the criminals also changed and they realized, buy them. I've seen rhino money buy many good people and they lure you. They realize that maybe the fridge broke down, maybe the old vehicle broke down, maybe there's children that must go on some tour and they help them out. As simple as that. It could also start quite innocently. Oh, tell us when your leader is on leave again. In the dry scene, where is the water now? Because they know they'll find it. That it comes in so many guises. And it's so easy to, to fall into the trap where you have been corrupted and when you started helping and when, like I say, the greed kicks in. I call it the war from within. All around and even internationally, it has made out as if half the Rangers of Kruger are corrupt. That, that's not true. It's unfortunately a significant factor, and that is why we instituted integrity management, where as part of your service conditions, you're expected to do lie detector tests and can then be investigated if that shows deception. It remains a sensitive issue. It is difficult to investigate where do you get the resources, but to see rangers work 24-7 to achieve, to, to safeguard our natural resources, to be betrayed. That's compelling to make sure that we reach out, visibly supporting them and investigating and prosecuting those that are guilty. Have you ever had a ranger come to you and and say, hey, like these people are putting pressure on me and what do you guys do to help in that kind of situation? No, not really. They, they would stand up in the group and normally in a roundabout way, make that be known, S say that they are tired of working so hard, knowing that not everybody works so hard, not necessarily pointing the finger. Uh, there were often that instances where they would almost lament, do you realize this or do you realize that? Mm. So no one's like, I, I guess I'm thinking more of a good ranger that says, hey, these people are intimidating me. Can, can you give any support? Uh, have you had rangers come to you with that type of um, sentiment? No. Remember, it's a very sensitive thing and a very personal thing. And it is, it'll be very different or difficult for a ranger. And even in the culture that they live in, to split or to go report, that doesn't easily happen. It has happened, not to me personally, though, or with me personally, though. Yeah. And I, I, like you mentioned, the integrity tests are kind of a hot topic. What's the current situation with them? Because I know you know, a lot of private reserves, I think even for hiring and maybe twice a year, they'll do integrity tests. And if they fail, they could potentially lose their jobs. You know, what's, what's the purpose of them? What's the effectiveness of them? And what, how's Kruger using them? And is there any change you would make if you could? Integrity management is a term that we've developed uh, way back in 2013. Lie detector testing didn't sound so good. And remember in our country with our liberal constitution and very liberal labor legislation, 
rightly so, one has to be very careful not to overstep and stay in your lane. If today in Kruger it's part of your conditions of service, it can be done before you're appointed and it can be done when there's suspicion. It's a little bit different in the private parks that has a bit more room to play with because of the right of admission. I have the right of admission of this private park. To do that to a civil servant, unless you have very good grounds, you'll have to collect evidence before you come to that point. I think they're managing it the best they can. It's so easy to say that in the state parks, things are out of hand. I think people must look at the results in, in all the, the national rhino parks and provincial parks uh, where this is applied with regard for due process, but also making sure that the rot does not spread unnecessarily. How have things changed since you came in? So it was the end of 2012. Can you kind of go through the amount of rhinos that were being poached and how that shifted over time? And uh, maybe even talk a little bit to, you know, I've talked to recently Grant Folds and he works a lot in KZN and some of those other areas. And they were, he was just saying how Kruger was kind of the first place that was being attacked. But once things, once you guys started to get better at anti-poaching and it became harder to poach within Kruger, that pressure moved to some of these other parks. And then all of a sudden they had to kind of make a plan and figure out how to combat similar to when you first came to Kruger. John, about this asset called Rhino. We started there by 2012, somewhere there, a decade and a half ago, roughly, in South Africa, about 23,000 rhino. And I say about, because these are published figures that I haven't researched or anything. We lost in the vicinity of 12,000 rhino since 2012 to today. Roughly half of them in Kruger. And reportedly, say Kruger has a third of its population left. People are very critical. What did we expect? What do you expect under that pressure? Yes, when we got more efficient and professional, the threat displaced. And the next best thing is the Flubin Volusi Park in KZN. And also a bit to the private sector. The private sector has the benefit of smaller properties and parks, and then also to their credit. They, in many instances, are very effective in hiring the right people and utilizing force multipliers and people to the best benefit and at full capacity. The fact that we today have fifteen to 16,000 rhino left, despite having lost 12,000, is indicative of good biological management, relocation, good breeding. It's still a sad state of affairs, but the ultimate is a growing rhino population. That's our aim. And I'm convinced that we're getting to that. It's a long road ahead of us. If you wink too long in this business, it'll be carcasses, but it can be done. It was showed in the other six a rhino parks, national rhino parks, where I took the middle 2013 through the steps learning from Kruger and where over the past five, six years, almost zero losses in those six parks. Similarly, in the Eastern Cape, there is a park where now they're relocating black rhino for the fifth year. So the whole notion that the state is out of control and they cannot do it, that's also not true. It's a matter of scale. It's a matter of the real threat. And yes, I say again, with great appreciation for what the private sector is doing. They own more than half the rhino in South Africa now. Yeah. And I remember in the book too, there was especially the first few years where maybe the rhino numbers were still high, but you felt like you were becoming more effective because even though the, the numbers were high, the amount of incursions were increasing by a drastic amount too. And the numbers weren't, the losses weren't increasing by the same ratio. So you could tell that there was a change beginning to happen. I don't know if you can kind of put yourself back in that place and what you were thinking and and how effective you were feeling you were being. I remember exactly those days. Remember my remark, who generals are those who win? Midway through the first year, the chairman of the board leaned forward in his chair. He said to me, General, when will the numbers come down? And it took us almost three years to get to that point. And then people would say, ah, oh, they lose less rhino because there are fewer, which of course is a factor. But the fact that the demand remained the same, the pressure remained the same, and one could stabilize and then start driving it down. That was a hard won victory. It's by no means victory in the, the total scheme of things. There's a lot to be done, mm. but it could be arrested. We have a free roaming population in Cuba that can now grow. We must continue. The recipe inside is clear. The recipe outside, the clear the park from the outside will determine what it'll look like in 10 years from now. Yeah. 
Let's talk about technology. I think actually the first time I saw you speaking was at a conference that my good friends, uh, Ashwell Glasson and Cochran was there too. I kind of listened in a bit and I think it was all about technology. And that's been a huge part of your role as well at Kruger is kind of figuring out what you guys need to be the most effective you can be. And I really liked some of your thoughts on it. Maybe I'll just let you kind of start talking about the importance of technology and how you decided to choose what you chose to implement. On the matter of technology, I knew from the very beginning, even my background and my skill set, that one would need technology. Like I said, you could deploy 2,000 people in the park if you wish to have the money and if you wish to change the total ambience of the park. It, however, became quite a lonely journey because there was no guideline. I had to start working with the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research to draw up a mind map. And only in October of the first year did we get a grasp of what we can do to ensure better awareness, better situational awareness, better information using the much spoken about tech in an array of sensors that can be put underneath the subsoil, on fences, on vegetation, on animals, on vehicles, and on aircraft, and how to fuse that into your, your nerve center or your joint operation center. I say lonely because when a thing works, it's good. Everybody is applauding. To discover, to understand the working, to painstakingly go through the steps and integrate my previously mentioned hardware, software, and wetware was more difficult than I thought in a not-so-tech-savvy environment. And then I admit in the book that year and there I didn't take people along. There was just not the time to take people along, and that led to later on them abandoning some of the projects after I left, which is a great pity. I had a wonderful encouragement from Mr. Howard Buffett. He said to me when he gave me the ground, you're a pioneer, you will make mistakes. If you fail, fail fast, then we do something else. Now, everybody didn't see it that way. Everybody wanted anything to work as long as you don't have to push buttons or maintain it or anything. (laughs) To this day, John, to this day, I believe there's a lot more in technology. The Rangers deserve their slice of the fourth industrial revolution. There must be better things we can do so that it's not always that this head-on fight, the war of attrition that we are fighting. We've got to create superior circumstances for our rangers with technology. And I'll keep pursuing that in my official and personal capacity. Yeah, I think technology is extremely important. Uh, I think the biggest challenge, though, which you talk about some and which I remember uh, was part of the discussion, I think, in that conference that I watched, it's just there's so much technology and so many things to choose from. And also a lot of people approaching and saying, hey, try our stuff out. And then maybe the support doesn't follow through in the long term and you choose something that all of a sudden becomes either obsolete or isn't supported anymore. And I remember in the book, you talk about everyone was like drone happy when that happened and was pushing drones. But there were a lot of challenges with that technology at the time, at least what you could afford. So maybe go into just the overwhelming amount of, I don't know if it's decision fatigue or you know options that you have and how you navigate that. One had to make many choices as best informed as you could afford at the time in terms of your attention span. And remember, you didn't have a panel with due respect of knowledgeable people. You didn't even have a line leadership that would necessarily understand if you tried to explain and get approval. So sometimes they were approved only later to say, why why did you do this? Which is human, I suppose. We got caught up and still are to an extent between industry push the sector is alive, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of grants and philanthropy around, and donor pool. Industry will push and they will convince the donors that they actually need this. And you end up with something that you cannot afford or that you cannot maintain or that the people cannot operate. I as uh, the slogan or the jargon that says, you've got to do brown earth technology in Africa, not blue sky. Yes, let's look at blue sky, think big. But brown earth meaning that the thing is durable, it can work in the African on the African conditions, the rangers will be able to operate it, and it's as cheap as possible to maintain, upgrade as it can be. Yeah, I think, you know, even outside of just the ranger side of things, it seems like what do you call it, donor pool. I feel like that happens to a lot of NGOs that are dealing with all kinds of different topics and issues where yeah, maybe 
donors want to say, hey, use this technology, they'll even pay for it or give it to you. And then all of a sudden, you've kind of handed something that maybe it works for a little while, maybe it doesn't work at all, maybe you invest a ton of time learning how to use it, and then it's not supported. Talk about that a little bit. There are some instances where the decision is not easy, and you want to give it a chance. Now, right there, now you've it takes time. You've got to commit your rangers, yourself. You've got to look at the trials, look at the effect and the impact that it has. And like you say, it works for a short while. The poacher sort out the tactics. And now do you tell the donor or the industry to come pick up this. You're afraid to miss something. Maybe you haven't tested it enough. You hear that it's working elsewhere. It was not an easy environment to make decisions in. And to this day, people are hesitant. Like I say, if it works, everybody loves it. If it doesn't work, somebody must be guilty. Uh, and uh, the old general wanting playthings and toys. Of course, that's a popular scapegoat. <laughs> and I say that it wasn't that bad, but there was a, a big f- part of it was that. And again, unnecessary pressure. I, I had to fetch the money for all of this. Huh? I mobilized over 400 million rand. Okay, it's only rand, but in five years. One had to travel the world on time that you didn't have. Traveling always sounds so adventurous and romantic. You travel looking on your mobile phone, seeing Rhino fall, and go get the money. All that money had to be mobilized by myself with good partners, like the Peace Park Foundation, like the Honorary Rangers. Yeah, I can only imagine being that far away when there's, you know, your men and women are out there dealing with this type of stuff on the front line, It's and you're trying to gather these funds from around the world. Can you talk a little bit about the mindset of, you know, did you have to do much work to convince people to to try new technology out? Because I feel like there's always a lot of, any kind of change is difficult with an organization and people. Yes, indeed. It was a challenge to lead such that you, that you take along your wetware, your rangers. Not a very tech-savvy environment with due respect, newer generation a little bit more, and then the burden, uh, no technology comes without charging the battery or cleaning the solar panel or maintaining it. And that's extra. Initially with the canines, they, now the, the, the handler had to make sure that the dog is kept and everybody's off already after work and he, he's got to do that. A canines, I grade in the same category as technology. Uh, and I, sometimes I think they're better. Taking the people along on the journey keeping them on that journey, encouraging and motivating, let's improve this, let's get uh, another one. It was, it was almost never ending. And it was just so easy to just let it go. Let's rather not do this. Bring me my bucky and my rifle and my piece of night sight equipment and I'll, I'll carry on for now. What has worked? What's had the most impact over the last 10 years? The most efficient technology is our radar systems. The mobile radar systems that we have developed that I describe a little bit genetically in, in the book. In the bush, two sensors work well. Magnetic, subsoil maybe, and radar. It works very well. It's put over and it speaks for itself. Magnetic, the only thing it can be triggered other than a poacher with a knife in his pocket is, a, is an animal caught in a snare. And that's good, then you know that also. Radar, huge potential for the future. I talk about a dome. You put a dome over that population of rhino and you know what's happening in that dome. And if you're situational aware, then you start getting proactive and you prevent the crime. Yeah. Interesting. Talk about the canines a bit. You just mentioned them. I I got to spend some time with the canine unit at the wildlife college and I've watched them many times running out to the helicopter when something's happening in the field to assist in Kruger. We started off when he ended up 2012, six dogs, mostly with the special rangers. Today, it's about 70 operated there. S- sniffer detection dogs, track dogs, and then the hounds. I, I built, and forgive the eye message again, that canine center with, with donor money. And then the honorary rangers helped me put up uh, the operations room, the storage for, for the, for the, for the dog food, the operations room, the accommodation, uh, furnishing the accommodation where rangers stopped when they came for the, when they come for the refresher training. It's a proud little center run by a few brave people and committed people. 
It is a force multiplier of note. It has been the proverbial game changer, more probably than about anything else that we uh, implemented over the past decade. How are they used in the field? Can you describe an incident and how they're deployed and how effective they are? You would typically, if you get tracks, fly in the dog team or deploy them because normally as you pick up tracks in the morning, you would pre-deploy. You leapfrog and anticipate where they will cross a road or where you can pick up the track. And then a good dog can do its 25 kilometers. The hounds has brought a new dimension. You fly them in, they're very good on a cold track, and they just run them in. So much so that you have to follow by helicopter with your reaction team. It almost eliminates risk for the poacher and the rangers because now the dog will point and you don't walk into each other in the middle of the bush and react unnecessarily. Game changer. I, I don't like the word game changer and turn around and watch <laughs> game changer. Yeah, it's pretty impressive to watch those dogs in action. I've, I've seen it a couple of times. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Let's go into some of the criticisms. And uh, we mentioned earlier green militarization. What, what is green militarization? What's, what are people kind of charging you and others with in terms of making this too much of a military action? Um, I don't know if there's any truth to any of the claims or, or are they just missing something? Maybe you can kind of go through your perspective. I know you've been a- accused in the past. The biggest problem that I have, and, and of course it's good to have a healthy debate, uh, it's mostly academics. They never offer any alternative. But the biggest problem I have is that it's either or. The whole suggestion is that if you do bo- um, uh, commission an anti-poaching unit, it's supposed to be anti-community. People will go as far as to say, but if you spend all that money in the community, really, do you want me to stop all of this and I just throw it on the community? It's as if they take the past 100 years and project it on this 10 years, the either or, that you should have rather done it with the community. Some people argue about ethos, that now the rangers are not balanced individuals anymore. They don't stick to the ethics of conservation. I don't know what is what is more of a demonstration of ethical commitment than to defend those. And in the meantime, still, by the way, do other work as well. The other all thing was uncomfortable, never any alternative. And then here and there, the mischievous military brought there by Houston, as if a third of my career was not spent in transformation the last 10 years. And <laughs> I always started to explain where I were taught how you transform, how you pursue solutions, a toolbox of solutions. But when you enforce the law, it's a iron fist, but with a velvet glove. You cannot do it half-heartedly, but be aware of impact. Impact on your own people, the adversary, and people around you when you enforce the law. If anybody today can convince me of anything else to do, I say, let's stop this. This is an intervention of necessity that unfortunately has become institutionalized over the continent. I don't know how else to make sure. That, on the one hand, there's a big accolade for the rangers. But how do you make sure that you keep your ranger safe and alive <laughs> by training and equipping them to face the adversary? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, having spent a lot of time there and seeing the rangers in action and the pressure that they're under and the poaching, it's hard to think of another solution that, like you said, all the money shouldn't go to just being more militarized. It's a, it's a huge how did you word it from the outside in is kind of how you you imagine solving this problem. But if you take the ranger away, you take the the paramilitary side away, then it's it's basically a free for all until those other problems are solved, which it's a, it's not a there's no quick solution. This is a lot of complex socioeconomic issues, not only in South Africa but around the world that are you know putting pressure on this situation. And I think you know Ruben de Kock, who was is featured in our film Rhino Man was a great trainer that helped bring the ranger training to the African Wildlife College. He always talks about, you know, I'm training them to save their lives, to protect themselves. It's not this training isn't really to be all gung ho military, let's go shoot some poachers. It's about protecting their lives, about doing it, you know, the most ethical way possible and defending against this onslaught that's happening while 
of course, acknowledging that there's a whole load of social issues that need to be solved on the outside. And and I think rangers sometimes are some of the best ambassadors connection between these conservation spaces and the communities. I mean, they live in these communities that border where a lot of the poachers come from as well. And our good friend Anton, who we talked about at the beginning, was probably one of the best communicators I met in terms of how to solve this from the outside, including communities and bringing them in and all the other work that goes into solving this problem. And maybe that's kind of a way we can shift into the broader perspective and working with communities and and other organizations to solve this on a larger, broader scale. Even if we only start uh, consolidating and coordinating all the projects, if the welfare type departments, rural development, economic development, labor organizations can pull together what we have achieved on the security sector and start coordinating, it will make a huge difference. There are many good projects happening. It's a matter of interest in 2016-17, Kruger did extensive consultation throughout the country, including adjacent to the Kruger there, there in that area that I call the fault line with 2 million destitute people. Not once, not a single item of criticism was leveled at the, at the Rangers. Of course, everybody wanted jobs. I forgot number two and number three was security. Let's have security. It's not as if they experience that the Rangers are anti or are not part of the community. In fact, I we often find that they're quite proud. And that, that's why it's so sad that recently, last week, another publication came out. And we must be careful. In the bigger scheme of things, it's a very few people criticizing it and hammering the green militarization as if somebody invented it, as if somebody is enjoying it. Although, yes, there are the accusations. Some people with a military background like this and the industry like this. We must be very careful for these voices not to be overheard. It's it's actually a, a negligible part of public opinion, I think. How do we coordinate on these other projects? I mean, you've done a great job at, at leading that within Kruger between the police and the courts and all these other different organizations that are coming to support technology and other things. But how would you see these other organizations coming together? Like, where would that leadership come from? Where could it come from? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I have, and it's not an official viewpoint. And by the way, this whole podcast is in my personal capacity, please, if we can record that right at the beginning. I see private sector playing a huge role. I see international private capital playing a huge role, but then you need projects. And I mean real projects with a management team where the finances are specified, where you define the outcomes, where you have a program plan and it's monitored. The state will need that support. What happens now, civil servants are trying to make business plans with due respect and project plans and it doesn't work out. Alternatively, they go get a consultant. A million rand later, you have a thick report and guess who's often written into that proposal? We need projects. And the leadership, private, public partnership type leadership that will serve as a magnet also to take everybody along on the journey. Because even knows in the long run, there are two strategic solutions, demand management and community ownership. There can be no other outcome or final state or end game than that if we want to preserve our natural resources. Yeah, absolutely agree. Let's talk about the book. Why did you decide to write a book on this? It's titled Rhino War. It's actually a nice little story. Uh, by the way, about the title, I, I wanted to say the so-called tongue-in-cheek Rhino War. Mm. But I was convinced by the publisher, that let's, let's go this way. It was never really a conscious decision, John. I sat during lockdown reading Tony Park's novels, the Australian guy. And I was so impressed with his knowledge of the African bush. 20 novels written in Africa. He stays here half his life. He has a house, Kruger, and one on the south coast. He loves the country. So that is why it shows in its writing. And I said to my wife, even in him doing this popularized writing, he actually sells the continent. He brings people into the experience of the African bush. So I contacted a mutual friend in Sydney. said, put me into contact with this guy if you can. I will, when next time he's in South Africa, have a couple of brides, I'll save him a lot of time. Not because I'm intelligent, but I know stuff. 
I could save him a lot of research time. We started communicating and Zooming, and three weeks later, we agreed on a book. And being Tony Park, we got Pat McMillan as a publisher. So we had the luxury of starting to write a book with a publisher. So after six weeks, we were flat out on the job, starting to write up a book that has come out popularized because we want people to read it. The book, in my view, is a message of hope. It shows leadership and it shows change management or the lack thereof, but it's also a reality check about the complexities and the challenges of nature conservation in law enforcement, in nature conservation, and a pointer of what will be required if we want to secure it. Mm. Yeah, it's really, really well written, and it does a great job of kind of giving the the bigger picture of the situation, as well as your context with your life, and and then able to you know zoom in on specific events that have happened in a very visceral way. So uh, it's it's really well done, and and just kind of following this topic and being so immersed in it for the last four years, uh, you know, a lot of it rang true, and just kind of gave more depth to the situation, especially the Kruger side, you know, like I mentioned earlier, very close with Timbavati and the Wildlife College, but haven't spent a ton of time in Kruger and or with Kruger Rangers. But yeah, it's, it's really well done. Uh, what was that process like working with Tony? It came rather easy. He has a, he has a bit of a military background. He's a, an Australian Reserve Force major. But the main thing is our mutual love for the bush. I traveled to their house last year for one week where we finished the thing. And it is really an easy, open relationship. And I cannot remember a single time where we could not correct or self-correct or agree on how to put something. It was an easy re- relationship. To, to this day, we've done book shows, dozens of them the past three, four weeks together. It's a good experience. Much respect that I cannot write like that. So the publisher at the time said, your story, his writing style, we're in. Mm. And uh, <laughs> he's, he's also a knowledgeable business person. He's doing the Amazon thing for us on his own. And we've only sold to Pan Macmillan the, the local rights. The other rights we have to ourselves as we try and sell this internationally. Yeah, and I, uh, I got it on Amazon through Kindle because I was kind of in a rush. And yeah, it's, a, it's really well laid out. It's really well written. Like you said, Tony is an amazing writer. What do you hope for this book to do? I mean, you, you mentioned it's a message of hope, but do you have any ambitions for what it could do in the world? I would be very satisfied if it can make out the Rangers as the heroes. If it can, in the boardrooms and the passages, create an understanding of the complexity. And you don't solve a complex problem with a complex a composite solution. You cannot... Now, as a management, as a parks management, as a department, look at this as if it's little parts that you don't have to put together. There are many moving parts. I hope that people realize decision makers and political leadership, you put them together because there's a lot at stake. It's our heritage. And if that is too fuzzy for you, it's our economic engine through tourism. There, and we And we don't have time. There's no time now. You've got to think big, start, small, act now. Could we all heed that call of urgency? Yeah, and it's not only your heritage, but I feel like it's the world. You know, it's uh, there's not too many places rhinos are left, and you're on the front lines. But we're all benefiting from it. Indeed. Yeah. What's one of the most challenging experiences you've had throughout your career, and and how did you overcome it? In the military, there are the two phases. First, we had to win a war. Whether it's a just word, that doesn't matter. And then they had to win the peace. And none of us in the senior ranks ever doubted the transformation and the quest for legitimacy and equity and all the other aspects of transformation. That was very challenging. In the corporate world, it was a privilege to interact with so many armed forces around the world. But realizing when you talk to the person Behind it is also political decisions and who are you arming here? Who do you sell to? There was a very good mechanism to take the decision and it's nationally governed, but that responsibility. And then in this last career, and I'm being selfish about it, was realizing what it'll take. The fact that it took three years to stabilize 
they, despite all the other adverse effects and external influences, that was very difficult to remain logical, to remain calm under that circumstances and, and to lead well. And I say in the book, sometimes I did not lead so well simply because of pressure. And to work in a, in a situation where almost all your influences are external. We all know in modern day management, external influences you've got to manage. But if that becomes the driver, I mean, two thirds or three quarters is external, <laughs> very challenging indeed. Did you have any doubts while you were doing this job in Kruger and what did you do to kind of push through those or remind yourself like this, this is something I need to keep doing? Never, never. There are 13 principles of war that are as applicable in the civilian life. One is you choose and you maintain the aim. You can tweak it. There will be tactical situations. There will be operational issues. You choose and you maintain the aim. And it happened on my beat. Many rhinos died on my beat, but many rhinos were saved. And despite setbacks and opposition and here and there lack of resources, never any doubt. One could always avoid emotion to take over. To look at the hard facts, leaders face facts, and you act on facts and you make decisions. I know, humanly speaking, it's not as clinical as that. Yeah. What does the future look like for you? You're doing a lot of work with Peace Parks Foundation now, uh, still heavily involved in Kruger. Yes. It's, it's my 10th year in this third career, and I have very little to do with national parks and Kruger specifically uh, the past three, four years, working more nationally, a lot with the private sector. Yes, and one foresee a few years still being allowed to do this. Yeah, you've had an amazing career, and it's it's definitely been an honor chatting with you on this podcast episode. What advice would you give someone that wants to, maybe we'll keep it specific, help with this fight with the rhino issue, help rangers? What advice would you give them coming into this world? I often get asked that question, and spontaneously I say, be an ambassador. Yes, I know some of you can give money, some of you can support materially. Be as informed as you can. Avoid negative people that have a problem for every solution. Be careful around the bright fire, where you go socially and officially, that you don't have all the facts and won't fall into the trap of talking this situation worse than it is. You don't have to be silly, you don't have to have proof of everything, but can you help us? to fathom and to understand and to relate to this as if it's our problem, be harsh in your criticism, but be realistic in your assessment. Be ambassador. Mm. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us, General Eusta? It was a great honor to even up to now be allowed to formulate strategy and to implement it. It doesn't have an open in your career. In the military, I write in the book that Towards the end of my career, the resources were so restricted, you actually did a spreadsheet exercise. I then went corporate and I thought, now strategy, to learn that often strategy is the opinion of the boss packaged into a nice PowerPoint with due respect. And here I came along and I was allowed. Formulate strategy, implement it. What a pleasure. Mm. Yeah, well, again, thank you so much for this conversation and everyone should definitely check out the book especially if you don't know anything about the topic. I mean, it just gives you a complete overview. And yeah, what an amazing career and amazing work you've done at Kruger. Again, the book is Rhino War by General Johan Eusta and Tony Park. So yeah, it's, it's been really special. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Rhino Man podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you're excited to see the film succeed, please subscribe and review our podcast on Spotify and iTunes. Then follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Rhino Man the Movie. More details about Rhino Man, the social impact campaign, and future screenings are at rhinomanthemovie.org. To learn more about the Global Conservation Corps and their work, visit globalconservationcorps.org. Sign up for the newsletter and follow GCC on all of the social platforms. If you like this podcast, make sure to subscribe and catch up on GCC's Voices of Nature podcast, where Bob Ludke interviews a wide range of people who have dedicated their lives to making a difference in conservation. A special thanks goes out to Simone Wilson for the music for this podcast. He's the brilliant composer for Rhino Man the Movie. Learn more about his work at simonewilsonmusic.com. Until next time, I'm John Jerko, and this is the Rhino Man Podcast. <laughs>